Okay, I'm going to give this a try. Um, hi, it's Miss Manwaring. Trying to make it so you can see the PowerPoint. This is the Gilded Age, episode one. I'm actually only going to go through about 10 slides. I haven't really got through most of it. So mostly I just wanted to talk to you about a little bit about where you were in middle school and where you are theoretically uh, as of high school. This class is from 1877 to the present. And so that means that we are after the Civil War. Some of you know that my poster of the Ford Theater is over there on the wall. So we are talking about from Abraham Lincoln to 1877, 1865 to 1877. It's called the Reconstruction Period. And the reason is, is because we had this really freaking mammoth Civil War. 600,000, more than 600,000 people were killed. And so it's called the Reconstruction Period because they literally have to re- construct, especially the whole Old South, but a few places in the North. So it's called Reconstruction, and it's the period from 1865 to 1877. In theory, you would have learned about that in your middle school class or your, your junior high class, um, eighth grade, I believe. Uh, we start from 1877 to the present, but I just wanna talk a little bit about that time period, 1865 to 1877. Uh, during that time, people voted, black people voted, the, the Voting Rights Act passed, I think it was somewhere in like 1867 or something like that. And 80% of the black people in the South voted. Everybody, everybody, everybody voted. So what we're gonna find out today, uh, actually probably tomorrow now that I think about it, we're gonna be talking about the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise is also, or the Compromise of 1877 is called the Great Betrayal. And the betrayal that happens is happening to African Americans. And the problem is, is that African, -American, African Americans, freedmen, freedmen, voted from 1865 to 1877 in the Deep South because there were Union troops in the South during the Reconstruction period. And then we have the election of 1876, which is uh, Hayes versus Tilden. Tilden only needs one vote to be able to win the election. Hayes needed five, but then they had a big compromise. Some, some men in a dusty room, a smoky, dusty room, decided that there was going to be a compromise and that Hayes was going to be allowed to be the president. He was going to be a Republican president. Tilden will lose the election and the compromise is we will let you have the presidency for Hayes, but that means that you need to get those troops out of the Deep South. And so all of the Union troops were removed from the Deep South. When they took the Union troops out of the Deep South, then all of those Confederate people that had fought in the Civil War against the Union troops, all of those people were now free to dominate and discriminate against all of those black people. During that time, uh, during the period of Reconstruction, hundreds of people were elected uh, by a fair vote. By the way, 80% of all of the freedmen went to vote when they had those rights. Uh, shortly after 1877 and the Union troops were moved out, all of those people that had fought in the Civil War to keep slavery, those people now were preventing the vote. Black codes, Jim Crow laws, lynching, intimidation, death, Horrible things happen, and as a result, for close to 80 years, from 1877 all the way to the, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in the mid-1960s, all the way until then, there was discrimination and lynching and terrible, terrible stuff in the Deep South regarding African Americans, and they had no way to gain their rights. Uh, you know about that uh, black drinking fountains. There was called color drinking fountains and white drinking fountains. So anyway, that period ends in 1877 as a result of the 1876 election between Hayes and Tilden, and the compromise, the great betrayal, was that they took the Union troops out of the South. So I wanna make sure that I talked about that. I also, um, let me go ahead and click this button. I ordered a, a little clicker thing on Amazon, it hasn't come yet. So this is, says, the Gilded Age was a term coined by Mark Twain. Gilded means coated in gold but metal beneath the surface. Um, some of you guys know about that, like there's gold necklaces that are like really, really thick. Uh, in real life, there's no way those are real life gold necklaces. They are some other type of metal that is gold plated, which means that they were dipped in gold so they look like they're gold and they're gold on the outside, but there's no way they're really, really, really are, are actually gold. And so this is called the Gilded Age and that's what gilded means. It means that it's dipped in gold, that it's not really gold, it's just coated in gold. So they talk about this period like that because the Gilded Age has all sorts of corruption, pro-business presidents. Wait, let me just click that. 1868 to 
Um, mostly you can just basically consider it like 1865 to 1900 to the beginning of the 20th century. You can consider basically all of that the Gilded Age. Um, I want you to know that if you want to study and to have more information, you should absolutely watch Crash Course World History. Uh, you might have watched Crash Course World History. John Green, he wrote The Fault is in Our Stars. It's a book and then it became a movie. But he has Crash Course U.S. History videos. They're kind of fast, but lots of information. He's the smartest guy on earth, so you should absolutely watch them. It's generally better if you watch them after I've taught, and then it'll be a little bit, little bit easier for you to understand. So that's Crash Course U.S. History. And then the Gilded Age and the election of 1868. Okay, so Ulysses S. Grant, a series of mostly Republican, pro-business, pro-business. So from 1865 to 1900, uh, that's here, it's conservative, Republican is to the right, and so it's pro-business, but over here are laborers to the left, and they don't care about laborers. Like you could have your arm cut off in an industrial accident, and all that would happen is that the company would say, gee, sorry about your arm, here's your arm, sorry about that, good luck, have a good day, next, and they would have somebody else. So as a result, the opposite of that is that there's gonna be lots and lots of labor protests, there's gonna be labor strikes. Um, 1865, we don't start having industrialization in our country until after basically the Civil War. Once the Civil War is over, we really start to industrialize a lot, but those pro-business pro policies, um, the Republican presidents, all support business, but to the detriment of the workers. Uh, you guys have all seen the videos and you've seen the pictures from world history classes of little kids working 10, 12 hours a day, men working 14, 16 hours a day, covered in coal dust, working for pennies on the dollar. Uh, that is the case during the entire Gilded Age. It's all about pro-business, government corruption, um, uh, massive economic growth, but always for the elites, never for the poor and never for the laborers. You should know at the same time that in 1848, uh, a man named Karl Marx, you guys have heard of him, wrote the Communist Manifesto. The reason he wrote the Communist Manifesto is because he was caring about the laborers who were getting their arms cut off at a factory and would be sent away to die or to be unemployed forever and ultimately their lives ruined um, with no re uh, compensation for their injuries or anything like that. So that's why the Communist Manifesto comes about, is that it's Karl Marx trying to defend the laborers, the common man. So are the labor unions. Labor unions are going to defend the common man in this time period. But always, the government supports big business. They don't support the laborers. Okay, so again, it's filled with, uh, the Gilded Age is filled with government corruption, people taking bribes, um, underhanded, getting paid under the table. Um, close presidential elections like the one with Tilden where it was one vote versus five votes and then there was possibly corruption in the political process and then competition, strong, strong competition between, between the Republicans and the Democrats. You should know during this time, the Democrats are basically the Southern states. They are basically the Confederate states. And so again, we've talked about it in class that from 1865 to 1945, the only Democratic presidents that we had was Cleveland twice in non-sequential terms, uh, two terms, but not in sequence. And then Woodrow Wilson, who is also World War I, and then FDR, who is also World War II. Everybody else were Republican presidents. With that said, you should know that Teddy Roosevelt is one of the most famous, um, important rulers that we have, and he has a very progressive policy, and his progressive policies do support laborers, and yet he is still a Republican president. But he, he supports laborers uh, during that term, and he will go against big corporate interests like uh, Andrew Carnegie, which is steel. Uh, speaking of, when we're talking, you have your benchmark packets and everything that we could possibly ever be tested on, but sometimes I'm going to tell you some things way over and over and over and over again, like this. Rockefeller equals oil. Carnegie equals steel. Vanderbilt equals railroads. A man named Stanford equals railroads in California. And then they go across the middle of the country and Rockefeller, I mean, uh, Vanderbilt comes across the middle of the country from the east toward the west. And then Stanford goes from the west toward the east. You guys know, it was on your quiz, that the uh, railroad, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad happened in 1869 with a, a gold spike that was hit by a silver mall and we now had a railroad across the entire country. With that said, railroads could do anything they want. They got free land from the government to build their railroads. They could charge enormous rates to ship things. 
Most, most of the people who traveled on the railroad were very much elites. Uh, very poor people only travel generally if they were moving their lives to some place and they might take a train and try to bring everything they can but it was very expensive for people to be able to ride the railroad so mostly the elites are the ones that did that. Um, you should know that there's Transcontinental Railroad in Canada, Trans-Siberian Railroads in Russia, all over Europe there are railroads. So I want you to write this down. Um, you need to have it in your composition books. In like 1807 is the first steam boat. Steamboats go on rivers. Before that, you would have to paddle on the rivers or you'd have a big pole and you'd go across the rivers with it by pushing a big pole to get across the rivers. So in 1807, Fulton in Mississippi has the first steam boats. Like 1819, somewhere around there is the first steam ship. And a steam ship, think Titanic, are steam ships that didn't use sails for the first time in thousands and thousands of years, first time in forever, that boats would actually be able to go across a river or go across the ocean without sails. Like it was incredible, you wouldn't have sails in the river. But on the ocean, you would have had big, huge sailing ships like you've seen in pictures. But now they have steam ships in 1819. Then I need you to know the very first steam train, George Stevenson in England, had a train that he called the Rocket. And it was called the Rocket because it went 15 miles an hour. The Rocket, like people were on horses, riding horses and being like, uh, hey, how you doing? Good job, nice job over there. So that was just initially 15 miles per hour. Within 10 years, they were up to 35, 40 miles an hour. And so everybody across the world are creating and building train tracks from 1840s to 1860s. In our country, in the West, most of those people were Chinese immigrants. And in the East, most of them were Irish immigrants or other types of immigrants. Very poor, very bad working conditions, long hours, long days for almost no money. Many people were killed, even Indians. Indians would often, uh, Native Americans would often kill people that were working on the railroads because the railroads were destroying their way of life. So they were trying to prevent those railroads from being built. So you have to know in 1807 is the first steamboat ever. And then 1819 are steam ships. Before that, they were only sailing ships. And then in 1829, the first steam train. And very quickly, there were trains being built all over the world. And that's the transportation that became the whole 19th century is known for that technological change, that we have technological change Oh, let me click that. So the, the Gilded Age is known by massive technological changes, uh, like trains, uh, big business, corporations, companies, but always at the expense of the laborers who are always doing not so well. Uh, Pro-business government policies. The government supported big business. Similar today with Zuckerberg and Amazon and, I mean, Zuckerberg and Facebook and then Amazon and... Um, Bezos, uh, still today, those policies help them. There's mass consumption. A lot of things are being milk built in these factories and people are consuming them at a much higher pace than before. And then business consolidation. The very rich, rich, rich people are buying up all of their competitors and, and creating trusts and making it so that other people can't compete. So the big question is, is it a government of the people? Or is it for the people? It's really for the rich people. Standard Oil, again, you have to know these three people. Rockefeller equals oil. Carnegie equals steel. Vanderbilt and Stanford equal trains and, and train tracks. So Standard Oil, uh, it wasn't. The government wasn't for the people. The government always supported big business. Okay, so you have to know this term. You should probably write this down. It's called laissez-faire. Laissez-faire means let it be, leave it alone. So uh, even today, uh, a lot of Republicans, a lot of people on the right believe in pro-business policies and they believe the government should do little, that there should not be much government regulation, that you should not be able to have um, the government come in and try to solve problems for you. So that's what it was during the Gilded Age. It's a little bit like that now still. During the Gilded Age, the federal government said leave it alone, we're not going to touch it. We're going to let businesses do what they want. Indeed, actually, we helped businesses. We gave them free land for their railroads, uh, tax breaks. There weren't income taxes at the time, still no income taxes. And so most of the money that businesses made, they got to keep for themselves. There wasn't anything to do with the government in the grand scheme of things. Okay. So again, 
during the Gilded Age, 1865 to 1900 approximately, very laissez-faire federal government. Leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. Don't touch it, keep the business, uh, businesses out of it. 1870 to 1900 especially, the government historically did very little in the grand scheme. Compared to the 21st century, the government didn't do very much domestically. So I need you to know this word. So domestic, some of you have heard of it like, like with domestic abuse. Domestic abuse is like if there's some sort of abuse happening in the household. Domestic means the home or the household. And so in our class, whenever we talk about domestic, we're talking about here in the country, policies that affect people in the country, healthcare, education, transportation, everything that happens in here in America and only affects Americans are considered domestic policies. But everything that happens with any other countries that interact with any other countries is called foreign policy. So all, all semester, I'm gonna be talking about domestic policies and foreign policies. Domestic policies only means here in our homeland, in America, and foreign policy means any time that we interact with any other governments, okay? So we did very little domestically. Uh, we delivered the mail. We did deliver the mail. Uh, again, military has to do with foreign policy. So we had a strong national military and we cared about foreign policy, conducted foreign policy. We do collect taxes and tariffs, but there are not a lot of ta taxes and tariffs compared to the way we have taxes and tariffs today. Um, the one exception, they did administer the annual Civil War Veterans Pension. So all of those people that fought in the Civil War on the good side, on the, for the good guys, got a Civil War pension. Everybody that fought for the Confederacy, nope, there's no pension. You were fighting against the United States of America, so there's no pension for you. But the people on the, the, good, the good side got a pension. Okay, and so this is basically, oh, I went too far. Okay, this is basically how far we're going to get today. Uh, in class, we're always going to talk about Democrats and Republicans because the policies that people have, the policies that Donald Trump has, are, are very much influenced by his Republican background and being a Republican president versus a Democratic president. So the same thing is true back then. So there's a Republicans versus the Democrats. Even today, I think most of you know, Republican equals red, and it's to the right, and Democrats equals liberals, and it's to the left. The cartoon character is a donkey, um, and the Republicans is an elephant. But then there's centrism, which is down the middle, where you sort of are not very much on both sides. But, so the Democratic bloc at this time White Southerners wanted the preservation of white supremacy. Democrats, uh, during this time period, during the Gilded Age, were the Deep South. That's basically who the Democrats were, which is why there's only three Democratic presidents all the way from 1860 to 1865. Is the three Democratic presidents, which are Cleveland, Woodrow Wilson during World War I, and FDR during World War II. So mostly it was white Southerners. Um, Catholics, they were Catholic because most of the people were Northern Protestants. Protestant is Christian, Catholic is Christian, but they are, they are different. Uh, literally, Protestant means protesting against the Catholic Church. So they are very anti-Catholic. So clearly they would not be in the same party. So Catholics were Democrats. Also recent immigrants, especially Jews, were Democrats because this was very Christian, Christian, Christian on the right still today. Urban working poor is pro-labor, so Democrats cared about labor, 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 and laborers. Uh, the Republican bloc is pro-business, so that's Republicans is pro-business. Uh, this is pro-laborer, especially the poor. And then at the time, mostly farmers. Farmers were Democrat, but of course it's the Deep South, the agricultural Deep South, and so farmers. Today, most rural areas are Republican, very conservative, not, not Democrat. So at the time, farmers were Democratic. Okay, so the Republicans, Northern whites, pro-business. Again, most of them were Protestant. Uh, at the time, there was a thing called NINA, no Irish need apply. And so people would put those in their shop, shop windows or in their company business windows, and it meant no Irish need apply. So Irish, Italians, they were all despised during the late 19th century. Uh, they were bringing these foreign ideas from Europe and that nobody liked that, socialism, communism, these other ideas, and they were Catholics. 
And so they were despised, and a lot of people couldn't get jobs just because they were Irish or Italian and being Catholic. Uh, wasps. You have to know this word. It means white. Anglo-Saxon, which means like England, North, Northwestern Germany, Scandinavia. Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. Protestant is not Catholic. It is Christian. Anybody that is Christian that is not Catholic or Orthodox equals Pro Protestant. So white, English, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. And it considered most of the middle class were right, pro-business. Because they were uh, business managers or doctors or lawyers or things that had to do with big business. So that's where I'm going to stop today. I hope uh, everybody felt pretty good about this. This is mostly what I was able to cover in class today. Um, so tomorrow I will have a new video with new content. This is, I think, slide like 9 or 10 of my PowerPoint. Tomorrow I'm going to be trying to get through like 40 different slides. So I hope this helped. This is basically what I taught today in class. And I hope you guys have had a good day. This is Miss Manwaring. See ya.